Captain's Log Supplemental. I am uncertain as to whether I approve of these new uniforms that Starfleet has sent us or not. Whilst I understand it might be hip and cool to be part of the new movement, I feel that... The hoodie is not necessarily the most appropriate form of dress for an officer to wear when greeting a new culture. Hello and welcome to this campaign creator series as sponsored by World Anvil. WorldAnvil.com, our wonderful world aggregator, hero collector, campaign manager. Oh, it's everything that you could possibly hope for in terms of keeping your games on track and all of those wonderful details in place. And we're going to see today how we can utilize them to help improve our game. Now, we have been running a campaign. Hopefully you've been running a campaign, if you've been following the series anyway, for a few months now, and perhaps your players have got to the point where they're ready to move on to the next continent. They're willing to go and explore a new dimension or a different plane of existence. Let's look at a way in which we might be able to create a new culture based on an old one. Now, what is going to be different to what we've done previously, where we've kind of gone, oh, there's this culture, there's that culture, there's the next culture. This is a far more in-depth approach and look at how we're going to create a culture. And so for the remainder of the show, I'm going to go through some of this quickly. And then after that, the remainder of the show will be me workshopping through how I've come up with a create a culture where I use the Japanese culture, the Japanese samurai uh, culture, to create a new type of elf for my online or for my campaign. So that's that's the nature of the video. So let's look at it. First of all, I would always suggest that you start with some armchair research. Now, armchair research is the best type that we're going to be able to engage in under normal circumstances. If you can go to that particular culture, even better. If you can live amongst that culture, well, that is absolutely top notch. For example, I moved to Japan. Beforehand, I was doing armchair research of, oh, what's life like in Japan? Once I started to live here, I can now give you a very different account from what I had had before based on that. But armchair research is often what we can do. So research it, find a culture, go, I want to know what um, was happening in the middle of the USA in, say, 1220 BC. What was happening out there? What was out there? Probably nomadic hunters would be my guess. What was their culture like? What research has been done on that? What do we know about that? What are the Paleolithic records telling us? Go and do some research. So choose a spot on the planet and then find out about it. A, you're broadening your mind, but B, you might find some cool stuff. Now, once you have started to research it, you can then identify what you do and what you don't like. I know this sounds like it makes sense, but sometimes we feel constrained that, oh, well, if we're doing Russian culture-based individuals, we need to stick with Russian culture. No, you don't. Choose what you like and choose what you don't like because we're going to adjust it. Now, you're going to adjust it based on your setting, and that could very well be, what would it be like if we happened to have, um, let's say, the um, Inuit people from the Atlantic, uh, the, the Antarctic Circle, what if we were to have them, but they had magic? Would they be ice shapers? Would they? Would their magic? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Can they transform the, sh the ice? Do they? Do they care about this? Do they do that? What's different? How? So adjust it according to setting, and that's what I'm going to be demonstrating today uh, for the rest of the video. So, very simply, this was the process. I moved to Japan to study about Japan, and I have learned things over the last two years that I could not possibly have learned without have actually living lived here, but that's not important. Okay, so let's go to World Anvil. World Anvil I have uh, ready and waiting uh, for me. There it is behind me. This is the world of um, Gaia that we created. Uh, if you recall from one of the very early videos, created in Wonder Draft and then brought through here into World Anvil, as you can see. And we have developed quite, quite a lot of information around Utherios. There's the uh, pin that tells us about Utherios. We could go to Utherios itself. 
if we wanted to. Let's just let the map load up a bit. It's a big map. So there is the map of Ethereos, which we have already pinned with a whole bunch of pins and things. We've also spoken about that. But uh, we're not talking about Ethereos. Our players have now played enough of the game to want to leave. And they want to head out to a different continent. Now, they don't want to come down here to Latarii. That is not their intent. They don't want to go to Itzamatol. They want to come here to Tadashi. Now, already you can see the influence. And when we were designing this map originally, I was laying down cultures willy-nilly. It was like, oh, Japanese over here, Chinese over there, Norwegian over there. Let's put some Vikings down here and a dash of whatever everywhere else. So when you look at the map, we've got the Greek Romanesque inspired Utherios with Masisio over there. We've got Tadashi, Taldaras, and Kwan down here. Then it starts to change into Gautama, Askari, uh, Yiyong, so still very Asian. Then Gar uh, Karen Gunda has now started to change flavor already. If we go this way, Trovat, Biagos, Anchang, Dilshad, Washti or Vashti, we're starting to get into the Indian sort of inspired spaces. But we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at, specifically, we're going to be looking at Tadashi and how we can make it work for a bunch of elves. What are we going to need for that? So to do that, there's a template that I'm going to use within World Anvil. And quite, quite, quite honestly, it's it's thorough. It really does work in terms of creating a culture, and it is the ethnicity tab. So we're gonna we're gonna fill this in, and there's some things in here that you need to think about, and understand, and unpack, and try to extrapolate from. So when I think about the Japanese culture, and this is with ultimate respect to all cultures, so let's bear that in mind as well. When I think about the Japanese culture. There are a few things that instantaneously strike me. The first one is that it is a culture that is very individually isolating. There is very little physical contact. The greeting is a bow. There's no hugging. There's no handshaking. There is no physical contact. Even in a family environment, that is muted. It's restricted. And it's looked down upon. So there is that. That's the one that's the one side. So from a relationship perspective, we know Japan has a shrinking population because of a lot of these kind of factors and a whole bunch more, which I'm not going to go into. So there is this sense that that there is no need for physical touch. I I like that. Not personally. I, 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 I can't understand it personally, but that's because I didn't grow up in this culture. But if my elves have the same approach, don't touch me. I think that kind of works. We already think of elves maybe as party animals, woodland elves, but it also allows me to have an elvish culture which is very different from wild elves or from drow or whatever other elves I might have. So physically, they're going to be quite distant from one another. Another thing about Japanese culture is perfection of the same task. So the Japanese love to take something and do it right according to the procedure. So if the procedure says A, B, C, D, the Japanese will do it A, B, C, D, and they will not vary from that. They will not try and break that. They will perfect A, B, C, and D. And they will make sure that they do that very, very well and very, very, very thoroughly. As a result of that, a lot of the people that I have met in Japan are very good at sort of methodically working through processes. They're very good at following along what has been prescribed for them. I think my elves are going to be the same. Then, without a doubt, there is the language. And the language is all based around 50-odd sounds that the Japanese use. And their words are constructed out of those, those sounds. And as a result, there's a minimum, minimum that they can have, and then there's a maximum which is an interesting space. So you get a lot of words that mean the same thing. How do we translate that into our game? Well, it means that when we're creating names, when we're creating sounds or titles or rank or position, we're going to translate that across as well. So in Japan, it's generally a two-letter sound. So ka, ku, 
what, uh, all of those kinds of things. And when you then look at how it's written, often there doesn't need to be spaces between words because the collection of those two syllable sounds of the of the not syllable of the two letter per sound gives you your structure. So watashi wa watashi wa I watashi wa. So the she is three. I, that's I said generally it's two. Watashi wa. Wakarimas. Wakarimas. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you more Japanese than that. But when you don't understand, it's wakarimasen. But the double S is just contracted into a single. Wakarimasen. Do you understand is wakarimas ka. So very different to say how you would pronounce it in English, where in, wakarimas ka, there's a lot of implication that I'm saying do you understand? If I say wakarimasu ka, to you it means do you understand? If I say that in English and I drop everything and I just say understand, it is my inflection that turns it into a question rather than any other sound. In Japanese, adding ka onto the end of a word generally turns it into a question. So wakarimasu ka, do you understand? In English, we don't do that. We would have to say do you understand or hope that our tone is conveyed. It's an interesting approach. So when I look at my Elvish names, my Elvish names are going to be structured on the same lines. So gone are the ideas of Waithrendir and Ilvathwen, all those soft, long flowing things. Now it might be uh, Ratwadir, Ratwadir. So what, da, 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 to make it feel a little bit more like the culture that I'm trying to emulate. So that's that's a, a factor. And then, of course, we have Bushido, Bushido, the the samurai code, which is really interesting and very different from from where a lot of things came from and a lot of sources. You look at it and you go, OK, so Bushido was not this perfect chivalrous thing that we think it was that was part and parcel of it but there was still definitely major gaps between the samurai and the common man the average individual and that was reinforced at every interaction that participated it was a very complicated web of honor and prestige I like that as well. And I think the elves, it would work really, really well. So I'm going to try and translate that across. So those are the three pillars that I'm hanging things on. The naming, if you can get the names to sound right, it starts to become evocative. The attention to detail, to doing things right, is important as well. And that feeds into the idea of the Bushido, where you've got quite a complicated hierarchical structure, not nearly as complicated as some other places, of course, but you have this hierarchical structure and it's done correctly, it's done properly. And then finally, this idea of non-touch. I think that is also very important to, to bring across. So now that I've got that going, we can now start to fill in these tools into in, in these things. So we've got family names here. So now we know. So traditionally, I would say a good Elvish surname might be something like Elantriath. Elantriath could be an Elvish name. Could be an Elvish name. That is not how we are going to be working though. So we're going to now change this. L, 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 L as a sound doesn't strike me as being evocative of Japanese language, L. So we could change this, for example. Instead of it being L, we could make it. L and R are also not very common in the Japanese uh, spaces. So um, let's say um, N. N is a good one. N, an, tri, ath is not a big one. So let's drop that out. So it's N, N, an, N, an, tras could work. And untrust. And an is still a bit of a problem. What about an an or trust? No, an or 
and uh, we like uh, what did I do there? Wrong way around. And or n or n uh, n d stu star. Mass enstamas could work, could work, could work enstamas rather than elanthier. So it's about playing around and, and trying out different things and different combinations as well. So uh, let's go with uh, Walatherian. Walatherian, let's try and convert this one. Um, wa la ha. Li an. Yeah, that could work. Walahalian. Maybe the wa la ha. Kanas. Walahala kanas. The walahala. <laughs> it's getting a bit funny. Wahakanas. Wahakanas. That could work. That could work. So this is how I will then do it. And I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bore you by going through this ten thousand times. Are they feminine names? Are they masculine names? Are they unisex names? That's something that we can decide. One of the things that I love about Japan is color theory goes out the window. All of the ideas and notions that blue is for boys and pink is for girls, which is a very Western approach to life, does not exist here. Pink has the color of the cherry blossoms, is seen as springtime, as as positive colors and that sort of thing. And that's about as far as it goes. The samurai did wear blue, which they used to call katsu as its particular color. Again, there's that sound katsu, katsu, very nice uh, sound there, um, which was a particular type of almost royal blue, but that was, that was seen as being a victorious color. So it was red. That's similar, definitely, definitely similar to some of our approaches, but generally speaking, uh, maybe it's unisex all the way. That's entirely possible. It's not a problem. When it comes to ideals, this is where it starts to get interesting. So again, we go back to our, our Japanese source and we say, okay, well, what were, the, what were the beauty ideals in Japan? They have changed considerably. If we go to the period of the samurai, for men, it was a bizarre ball, bald center with a single top knot and then the side hair around, um, creating this very curious look. Specific, very much so, to the samurai. Fast forward to today, and the ideal is lots of hair on the top of the head and then no hair anywhere else in the masculine form. And that the masculine form is not a very domineering individual, but is a rather passive, more elegant kind of individual. Very different, very, very, very different. What I did find really awesome was the face mask that the samurai used to wear oftentimes have moustaches on them. They have these big bristles in the front. And you wonder, or at least I did anyway, why was that the case? Well, as a matter of fact, it's because a lot of samurai and a lot of Japanese, to that, to that matter, don't grow facial hair. They can't grow facial hair in some cases. In other cases, it's thick and really, really, really dark, which is not a problem. But generally speaking, they couldn't grow facial hair. And oftentimes, samurai were made as young as 14, where there was no hair to start growing in the first place. So the moustache on the mask indicated a certain level of maturity. So again, we start looking and we say, OK, well, how does this apply to elves? When you think of the Japanese, from a basic, basic tonal kind of range, the Japanese have very black hair, ranging up to very dark brown hair. Occasionally, it might, might drift to medium brown hair. But generally speaking, it doesn't. It stays within that space. And we know why. Genetically, the DNA is uh, dark hair is dominant to, to fair hair, for example. Uh, it's a recessive gene. When we start coming to things like blue eye color and red hair, definitely, definitely at the lower end of the spectrum in terms of DNA proliferation. So do our elves do the same thing? Or are elves always blonde haired? Do we always have to have blonde hair for our elves? I don't think so. I think that we could drift it away. Or perhaps, and this again is where we then look at what was happening for the women who were there. There could be women samurai, which I particularly appreciate. 
but there was also the idea of being as white as possible, as white as pure snow. Layer upon layer of makeup applied with delicate artwork to enhance the beauty. What if our elves were born with hair color of a certain way, but then obsessed about changing it to a different color? So magic is used to change the hair color of an elf. And again, we want to make this part of the world. So if the elves could just go, my hair is now bright pink and the magic lasts for eternity, that doesn't give us a lot of narrative value. But on the other hand, if it's a daily ritual, which requires the elf to spend some few moments with uh, sakura, with uh, cherry blossom uh, petals in a specific type of water container that they have to crush and then that they can rub through their hair and that changes their hair pink, that's better. Why? Because then when the character is suffering, when they don't have access to that kind of thing, their hair starts to lose color, they start to lose prestige, starts to lose, lose space. So I think we're going to add that in. I think it's a great idea. And again, just trying to unpack this, this whole thing based off of that. So um, dyed hair color of red, orange, uh, yellow. Okay, using a daily uh, dying ritual. Is that how you spell dying ritual? I hate that word anyway. Rich ritual. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Um, ritual, there we are. Thank you. Uh, using a daily dying ritual. We'll expand on this later. I'm just taking you through these ideas. Okay, um, courtship ideals. Courtship ideals. I would then say, okay, so in Japan, very little courtship used to happen. It was all prearranged. So you marry you because it strengthens ties. And you marry you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was very little choice in the matter. Love was certainly never a factor. And to a large degree, this, as far as I've been told, continues to this very day where some corporations will still provide brides uh, for, for prospective husbands um, who are going to work in the, in the company. So uh, that was a thing as well. Whether that's an urban legend or not, I'm not sure. But I've heard it from so many different sources here in Japan that, well, it's got to be true, doesn't it? The idea is, is that there is very little about the emotive side of things. From a Western perspective, that's what the Victorians were all about as well, was that it wasn't about love. That was just a crazy idea. It was about marrying into your correct station, marrying at your correct level, marrying slightly better if you could manage it, but also an extended period of time, four years of courtship before you could possibly even think about marriage. That was the norm back then. In Japan, we're looking at a similar situation where courtship might last for a certain period of time. But because there is this idea that one doesn't go home or that one lives with lots of people in, in, in so far as saving money and that sort of thing, it becomes problematic. So there's lots of, of socializing happening outside in public where displays of physical affection are definitely frowned upon to this very day here in Japan. And I myself even find it when there are rambunctious teenagers who are holding hands. <gasps> and I see a pair of teenagers holding hands. I go, oh, what's that? What's that display in public? How absolutely revolting. No, standards are dropping. Standards are dropping. It's all going to the dogs. Oh, it's all over. It's all over. And then, of course, I see tourists wandering around and tourists are all over each other because they're from Western societies where public affection is not necessarily frowned upon. And I'm like, oh, uh, lowering the tone, you see. Uh, can't take them anywhere, really. It's bizarre how one starts to accommodate and acclimate to that environment. So I think with our elves, it would be prearranged. I think that that would make the most sense. So uh, prearranged. I quite like that. And I would then, because we want to give a sense, remember we said one of our pillars was doing things correctly and, and, and absolutely by the book. I would say that there are 10 stages to the courtship. Each stage lasts for 15 years, again. Elves, long life, so we might as well accommodate for that. Each stage lasts for 15 years, 
and must be followed in sequence without delay. Otherwise, there is great dishonor to all involved. And again, I'll unpack this later on. I'm just showing you what I go through. So relationship ideals are mutual support without restriction, provision without expectation. Okay, provision of, of, of supplies, procreation, for continuation, continuation. Okay, so those are some of the relationship ideals. I'm not going to unpack those too much. Customs. I love customs. Customs are so cool. The whole bowing idea. The further you bow, the more respect you're giving to the person. When we go back to the age of the samurai, you prostrated yourself. Hands and knees. Hands pointed towards one another, showing very much the case that you were not hostile in any way. Face to ground. And you waited there until the person had passed. We've had similar kind of customs, the handshake, the bowing. It's, we've been there. It's, it's, it's part of who all cultures have some way in which one might greet the other. We need to bring that in. Again, we want no touching. We don't want any kind of thing along those lines. We want it to be a process. We want to, to, to showcase that the elves follow a logical step, a logical order. So I would say uh, when we are going with common etiquettes, again, these tabs, I love these tabs because they remind you what you should be talking about. So common etiquette, uh, greeting. When an elf sees somebody else or somebody else sees them, I would say that one must first nod. A nod is given. If reciprocated, I'll spell right correctly one day. Words, sentence, use. Reciprocated. Then a approach to three feet apart. Can we spell um, the right? Um, the formal announcement is made. I am so and so of house X. I greet you in peace. The correct response is I am so and so of house Y, our families have this, uh, our families are P, Q, R related. I'm going to put in brackets here, business, politic, uh, blood, or uh, other. Okay. So our families are related in this way or that way. So they're establishing I am so and so, I am so and so. Our families are related in this one. Um, response is correct. And I honor uh, your house. Why? Okay. So. All right, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to we're going to run through that. That I think is really cool, and I think that elves will be very specific that that must happen. And so when they encounter other races, how are they going to deal with them? What are they going to say? Um, I greet you in peace. So the correct response would be, I am Dorgan of Clan Bratach, and our families have no relation whatsoever. So the response can still be correct, and I honor your house, Bratag. 
so I think I think that works quite well. I, think that was, I like the formality of it. I like the formality of it. I don't think they would exchange anything. I don't think there would be any any sort of handshaking or anything along those lines. Um, dress code. Oh, we can spend days on dress code. I don't want this video to be long, but um, one just needs to keep going back to your source material. Look at what you're trying to do. Look at how you're working. Look at what your base structures are. In our case, it's the language, it's Bushido, as well as this non-touchy thing and doing things methodically and by the book. So I think that that, that is a guiding line. World Anvil is going to give you the rest. They're going to get you to fill in all of this kind of stuff. What are the funerary rites? What are the taboos? Give us some myths, some legends. That's why I like this. Look at these connections. Who are they connected to? How are they connected to the dwarves? What kind of information are you going to be getting? It's, it's all here for you to utilize and to, to enjoy. Uh, Japanese elves is what I'm going to call it so I can save those changes. I hope that this video has been useful, insightful in some kind of way as to, to how you can use a culture and how you can use existing stereotypes and try and find the best of both worlds so that when the players encounter these kinds of elves and the elves refuse to engage with the humans until they give the appropriate response because the elves do not know what to do if it's not A, B, C, D, if it's A, F, Q, the elves will be going and waiting for what? I'm waiting for B. Until I receive B, I cannot move on to C. So I shall wait for B. Is it, is it going to be that the elves will have someone, a protocol minister, who will come running forward and say a thousand apologies? They are waiting for you to announce the name of your house so that they might understand whether there is a relationship between the two of you or not. I think that those kinds of things are going to really, really make your characters and the cultures that they come from feel very different, whilst at the same time drawing on drawing on the cultures from around you. I always look at cultures and I, I, I try my best not to judge. I try my best not to impart my own cultural upbringing upon those that I meet. It is difficult. And there are lots of things about various cultures, about all cultures for that matter, which I look at and I go, I can't stand that. I cannot tolerate that. Japan is no different. They have uh, some very interesting, or I would say appropriately, very old fashioned approaches to things, but that's their culture. So we must look at it and realize that that is who these people are. And we can incorporate that into our narratives to make them stronger and to make them better and to reflect upon ourselves as well. Anyway, until next time, I hope that this has helped inspire you in some small way to, you know, either decide that I absolutely should never be allowed out of my own country or to at least look at your own cultures and draw some inspiration from them for your next creation. Until then, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of campaign creation.